On Overdrive today, we check out the refreshed Tata Harrier, 2023 Range Rover Velar, and the latest AMT variant in the Nissan Magnite. Hello and welcome to Overdrive. I'm Soini Dath. It's been a busy week for a few manufacturers who have showcased some of their future prospects at the Japan Mobility Show 2023. For starters, Suzuki unveiled the Swift concept that's pretty much production ready, showcasing level 2 ADAS functionality. They even had on display the EVX, the brand's very first electric car, which promises to go into production in Maruti Suzuki's Gujarat facility by late 2024. BMW showcased the iX2, which we expect on our shows by next year. Nissan showcased a series of gaming-inspired hypercar concepts that outline what the brand's lineup in the future could somewhat resemble. You can check out all the details on our social media platforms as well as the videos on our YouTube channel. Now, coming to the first story for this week, there's a new Tata Harrier in town and not only looks good, but it has plenty of new features and safety equipment. Now, the size and the presence that comes with it has been the Tata Harrier's biggest draw in the mid-sized SUV segment. Few SUVs give you as much attention for the price as the Harrier. But rivals in the segment aren't holding back, which is why you now have this. It's the mid-cycle update to the Tata Harrier, where Tata Motor seems to have tried to broaden this SUV's appeal. That being said, Tata Motor seems to have doubled down on the presence bit with the new face. That to start with fits seamlessly enough into the unchanged bodywork. The full width DRLs with the welcome animations are a great mood enhancer as well. The heavy dose of gloss black and the sharp sculpting around the discreet lighting makes the Harrier far less bulky to look at now. While the side profile remains unchanged, it's become a bit more streamlined with the new all black contrasting look. Changes to the rear are small but again effective. The full width lighting is on trend and stands out further with its sharp tiered design. It all fits in naturally into the redesign. The dashboard, at least the top half, is now completely new. So it's a much more contemporary design and in terms of fit and finish too and the perception quality, things have gone up significantly from the last version. For example, this top panel is now soft touch and quite a nice feeling one. And with this new design, again, with the whole persona themes that Tata is going with, this fearless persona with this yellow color also gets this yellow pattern in the dash. Now it looks great, it's eye-catching, it will be a bit polarizing. The new glow-up Tata steering wheel carries on with this discrete theme, seen here in a four-spoke design against the two-spoke in the Nexon. It's got that premium feel to it, but you have to work to keep it looking this neat. We found the horn pad to smudge quite easily and the gloss black panels also catch dust quickly. But overall quality levels have improved. But most eye-catching here is the new terrain mode selector. It functions with a slight lag but the crisp screen and textured feel add quite a nice sense of quality to the cabin. Now a big part of these new upgrades from Tata Motors has been the screens or the tech that's on offer and that's again exactly what you would expect from a new Tata car. You have this new 12.3 inch screen. It's like we've said earlier, a great example of how to do a touch screen. So you have this widget type arrangement in the home screen, which makes it very easy to access, you know, important functions like navigation, your music, your climate control, your devices and so on and so forth. And again, you have a 10.25 inch instrument cluster. The biggest advantage of which is that you can cast Google Maps right here on the home screen because the two screens here share the same ECU. And then of course you have a variety of information, a variety of views to go through and but like earlier we think that some of the fonts could have been a bit larger a bit more legible the features list has grown noticeably with this update here's a look at everything you now get with the new harrier again like in the front things have gone up a few notches now what has remained same is that great sense of space and comfort that you get with the harrier so as you can see with the seat set to my driving position there's a huge amount of knee room great leg room and again, like in the front, the seats themselves are very comfortable. Now, they haven't changed from the last versions. There's also a slight reclining function that you can use, which is handy. You get a sunshade, which is very well liked by all of us. And these aircraft style sort of head comforters, and they really do amp up the sense of comfort that's here in the back seat. And just to top off that sense of space, of course, you have a big, huge panoramic sunroof with the added benefit of now there being ambient lighting within the glass here. 
Tata Motors has doubled down on the Harrier's safety credentials with six airbags now standard and a driver knee airbag now added to the top trims. There's a useful 360 degree camera with a lane change view, TPMS, ESP and three point seat belts for all passengers. But the most effective addition is that of ADAS with its wider range of features. Automatic variants now get adaptive cruise control, but in this manual version we found the emergency braking and blind spot function to be well calibrated for Indian conditions. Now start driving the new Harrier and at least at the beginning it's business as usual. You have a good view out straight up ahead you. The bonnet, the edges of it are clearly visible in spite of this being quite a wide and large car. So you can place it on the road in a tight lane quite easily. That being said, the earlier sort of drawback of there being quite a thick A pillar and a really large wing mirror, that still continues. So visibility here is slightly compromised. And another drawback of this is that you still hear wind noise coming from this mirror and along the edges of the door sill. Now Tata has added this felt lining to it to reduce it and it has reduced but it's still noticeable especially if you have the icon reduced and no music playing like we are right now. The revised Harrier continues to be powered by the same Stellantis sourced 2 liter diesel with its 170 PS and 350 Nm. This can pair with the 6 speed manual as seen here or with the 6 speed automatic. This motor isn't the most refined of its kind but it's much calmer on the inside than before especially at idle and when you rev out the engine. You still feel some vibrations through the floor and wheel, but it's not acceptable for this segment. Now there aren't any surprises in the way the engine works. The Harrier pulls well right past idle and with this sizable low end torque, you can handle all but the tightest of city conditions in second gear. As the road opens up, you find the wide power band to be quite useful. It's easy to overtake with a step up in performance past 2000 RPM, while general highway cruising is quite effortless too. The gearbox may not be the slickest shifting out there, but it's good enough for the job at hand. It doesn't take too much effort to slot into gears and the clutch is light and progressive enough to not be too much of a pain in the city. But really what seems to have been the most noticeable update with this version of the Harrier is this new steering. Now it's an e-pass system which means that you also get steering modes. Now they're tied into the drive mode, so you have the normal steering mode with the Econa City mode and when you switch it to sport mode, the steering weighs up a bit more, so you have a bit more sense of control. And this really has made driving the Harrier just a whole lot better, to, which also ties in well with the general ride and handling character of the Harrier. And in terms of stability at high speeds, it again pairs quite well with the way the engine works, so it's got great straight line stability, you feel very solidly planted on the road. Like most new Tata cars, it's got that slight firm edge to it. So over broken roads, even though it'll just pummel through them in a very authoritative manner, you really do feel the sturdiness of the architecture when you go through a pothole-ridden road. There is a firmness, you feel a bit of it coming into the cabin, but it's never jarring, it's rounded off well. And then as you start picking up speed and say you have smaller bumps to deal with on the highway, again, it smoothens everything out. It's, with that whole very composed demeanor on the highway, it works very, very well. This fully comes through in some of the light off-roading we did with the Harrier. On a gravelly trail, we didn't really need to engage the rough terrain mode either. The ESE wasn't too trigger-happy and the Harrier balanced through these stretches briskly enough for you to not miss all-wheel drive in your everyday driving. This may be a mid-life update, but the Tata Harrier has become notably more appealing. It's become far more polished, not just in the way it looks, but also in the way it drives, addressing some of its previous flaws. The minor rough edges in the cabin inside also feel the most special place to spend time in. The long features list playing their part in this. With this new update, the mid-size SUV space has become a lot more interesting than before. We'll take a very quick break here on the show, but coming up on the other side, we'll acquaint you with the new Range Rover Velar. Welcome back here with us on Overdrive. There's a new Range Rover Velar in town. It's not only stunning to look at, but it's also got plenty of new creature comforts. Let's take a look. 
set your eyes on a Range Rover and you immediately get that traditional sense of luxury but in a crisp minimalistic form. Now the full size Range Rovers take this up to a whole new level these days but it all started with this, the Range Rover Velar. So with how well sorted the styling was to begin with, Land Rover hasn't had much to do with this update to keep the Range Rover Vela feeling fresh. You get new pixel LED lighting in the front and a slightly different grille pattern that adds a touch more modernity to the face. That being said, this clean swept look to the face that ties in with the unfussy bodywork still makes the Vela one of the more attractive SUVs out there. The new Range Rovers take this forward but the Vela's best angle is still probably its side profile. The way the roof and bodywork converge at the end give it a sleekness that looks rich. The new colour match 20 inch wheels on this example do a great job of complementing this too. The rounded look to the rear carries on with the modern minimal theme and has been spruced up with sleeker new lighting. This again fits naturally into the existing styling while adding a touch more crispness to the overall look. Now the overall design of the dash hasn't changed but the simple look of it and the smart play of materials and textures means that it still feels fresh and that minimalistic approach that you find in Range Rovers that's been taken to a whole new level with this VLR. You get a new steering wheel which fits into this whole wine red and grey theme very well and then of course the instrument cluster screen its basic outline has remained the same but the sub menus and the general look of it and the resolution seems to have grown better. But what immediately catches your eye in this cabin is this center console. There's not a button in sight, just a smooth flat layer of this textured wood here and it really does stand out in this crowd of quite fussy cabins. Of course you have this new gear lever, the new Range Rover and Land Rover gear lever and it's as usual quite nice to use, functional and crisp. But the fallout of this is that every function is now in this screen. And while it is a crisp screen that works very well, it's of 11.4 inches size, which to be honest, considering the amount of functions in here could have been slightly larger, maybe the 13 inch one from the full size Range Rover could have been brought down here. Even with the strong focus on style, practicality hasn't been lost on the Vela. The wireless charger is hidden away neatly behind the wood panel, and you have an ample amount of storage in the doors and in the deep central bin. Its split opening lets you maximize the space further. Boot space is good too at 552 litres since you get a full size spare. The Range Rover Velar happens to be pretty well equipped too. You get 4 zone climate control, Meridian audio, a 20 way adjustable front seat, and a PM 2.5 air filter. Now, the Velar is still a Range Rover, which means that you will not be disappointed in the back seat of it. You get this really large panoramic sunroof to begin with with a nice tint to it, and that brightens up this fairly dark cabin immediately. Although we would have liked sunshade, that's not bad news at all from here on. Now in terms of how comfortable it is, there's good headroom as you can see. Although if you are about 6 feet tall, that might be a bit of an issue with how the roof sort of comes in here. But there's enough place to put your feet, the floor sort of rises up which makes for a nice rest if you will. But what really sort of enhances the comfort is this powered recline function. And you really can recline to as you can see, quite a nice angle, so long journeys, you will be comfortable in the Velar. But safety could have been given more attention. There are no ADAS features and you get 6 airbags as standard. But there is a crisp set of 360 daily cameras, TPMS, hill hold, hill descent control and torque vectoring by braking. As expected from a Range Rover, the Velar will go quite some way off-road despite its prim exterior. You get all-wheel drive with the central locking differential, terrain response too with weight sensing, two off-road ride height settings, the transparent bonnet feature being the highlights. Now first things first, getting into the Velar is pretty easy. You have an access mode for the air suspension that lowers the car to a very comfortable height. Now coming to the driving experience itself, we are driving the diesel version of the Vela and this is powered by a 2 litre turbo diesel that makes about 204 PS and 430 Nm. And it is a very refined engine and one that suits the Vela pretty well. When you are just starting out like we just did right now, it's a bit hesitant to be honest before the turbo fully spools up. But once you are up and running, it's got that very likeable thing that diesels do, that linear flat torque delivery and 
It's got a fairly wide power band too for a diesel. So you notice that the Vela will keep pulling right up to close to 4,000 RPM, maybe 3,500, which means that even though in terms of outright outputs, it may be slightly down on other rivals within the same price bracket, but in the real world, you barely notice this difference. The 8-speed ZF gearbox also does its bit. In the D mode, it's a bit hesitant to downshift under hard acceleration, but in most sedate driving, the wide power band tides you through this. In any case, switching to the sport gearbox mode fixes this to quite an extent without the Vela becoming too snappy. You also have well-judged drive modes. These don't make an especially stark difference, but in the dynamic setting, there is a pleasing enhanced engine note that makes things more exciting. In any case, the Vela is as refined as you want an SUV of its price to be with well-controlled wind and tyre noise, helped by active noise cancellation. But really, what has changed from the last time we drove the Vela the most is the ride and handling characteristics of this SUV. The last version we drove was a petrol with, if I remember correctly, steel suspension, but with this new adaptive air suspension package, with the adaptive dynamics active damping, it feels a lot more sprightly, it feels a lot more planted than what we remember it to be. But generally in terms of an SUV that you would drive regularly, that you would, might sometimes want to push a bit harder, it has that connected, secure feeling that you want so much. Priced at Rs 1.14 crore on road, the Range Rover Vela competes with the slightly larger Mercedes GLE and BMW X5. As the sales numbers show, this new model has carved out its own space in this price range and it's not difficult to see why. You could ask for more space and performance, but you get the bragging rights of the Range Rover brand at a more accessible price, good features and driving dynamics, a stylish cabin and that striking look. It's time for us to take our final break here on the show, but coming up on the other side, Nissan has given the Magnite a new variant. Stay with us, you're watching Overdrive. Welcome back here with us on Overdrive. Nissan Magnite is Nissan's best-selling SUV in the country and it now gets a new variant with an automated manual transmission. It makes driving in the city a lot more convenient. Let's find out more about the Magnite Easy Shift. The sub 4 meter SUV space has grown a lot in popularity because of its perfect blend of various different aspects. For example, the Nissan Magnite. While it's not all that big for you to feel like a pain to drive in everyday traffic, it's also not that small for you to not be able to accommodate the family for a short road trip. Now, while the Magnite has grown a lot in popularity since its debut back in 2020, it did face one shortcoming. The non-turbo variants were not offered with an automatic gearbox. Nissan India has now changed that by introducing this new AMT transmission for all the non-turbo variants to make things just that more competitive in its segment. The Nissan Magnite has always been a very handsome vehicle. The face of the car looks quite striking with that sharp headlight design and wide grille, making quite a bold statement for such a low-cost product. The chrome bits and 16-inch alloys does make the car look more expensive than it really is. And even though the rear of the car misses out on any LED lighting, it still looks quite smart, especially with that bold Magnite spelled out so prominently. A new addition though, is the integration of the Easy Shift badge at the bottom right of the boot lid, which is probably the only visual way to tell this apart from its manual sibling. Also, this new black roof with blue paint is exclusive to just the Easy Shift variant. The cabin of the Nissan Magnite is still a familiar place to be. You have this quite an interesting dashboard layout with an 8-inch touchscreen and a 7-inch digital gauge cluster. And to top all that off, you have amenities such as an automatic climate control, push-button start, and quite a few cubby spaces to make life easier. Talking about the features list, the Nissan Magnite is quite stacked. The top variants get LED headlights, as well as LED fog lamps, a 360-degree camera, cruise control, a PM 2.5 air conditioning filter, and a lot more. Safety features include dual front airbags, ABS with EBD, rear parking sensors, hill start assist, a tyre pressure monitoring system and a host of other measures. The rear seats also haven't changed all that much. You still have adequate amount of knee room, good amount of headroom. Although we could do with more under thigh support, these rear AC vents and relatively large windows make journeys not all that uncomfortable. The Magnite Easy Shift gets the same 1-litre naturally aspirated 3-cylinder engine 
that produces 72 PS and 96 Newton meters of torque, but this time mated to an AMT transmission that still continues to put all that power down through those front two wheels. Of course, the biggest talking point about this Magnite Easy Shift is this AMT transmission that will be available on all the non-turbo variants. The transmission isn't the fastest to respond by any means. If you're in the middle of traffic, bumper to bumper, it does do a good job. But once you try to get into the higher RPMs is when the transmission takes good two to three seconds to respond. And you kind of feel like it's confused as soon as you put your foot down. And even when you do put your foot down, the power isn't all that linear. It does make you feel every single shift in your back but apart from that it's a pretty good transmission to have in the city but just don't expect too much as you would expect from the turbo CVT. Also this 1 litre naturally aspirated engine isn't the punchiest to begin with. The engine doesn't like being revved out and once you do that it makes a really loud noise which isn't very nice to hear. The suspension is one of our favourite things about the Magnite. It eases into every bump and you don't really feel anything. Of course, there are a few vibrations that travel about the cabin, but it isn't that major that you would be complaining about. If features and space is all that you're really out for, then maybe the Magnite Easy Shift is a great bet, as it comes with most of what you will ever need. It's still a great alternative to hatchbacks and compact sedans if you're seeking a relatively higher seating position. But if you do want something that could be more lively to drive without taking too much of a toll on your pocket, then you should probably upgrade to the Turbo CVT or maybe even look elsewhere. With that, we've run out of time on this week's episode of Overdrive. But remember, you can stay in touch with the team through our various social media platforms. And do check out our latest videos on YouTube. We'll see you next week. Until then, drive and ride safe.